Welcome to Brandon Hall Group's HCMX Radio, the only podcast in the HCM arena that weaves current market research, HR technology, and industry leaders into each episode. Our HCMX Radio host is our Chief Operating Officer and Principal HCM Analyst, Rachel Cook. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Cook. I'm the COO of Brandon Hall Group and the host of our HCMX Radio podcast. I am looking forward to our talk today. I have with me Ron Samir, the CEO of Allencom. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Rachel. And you're visiting with, with me today again for um, uh, through this pandemic. I think this is what our third time having you on our podcast. So There's you a lot to talk about for sure. Yes, and uh, you know, each time I learn something new, and I get to hear our our listeners and uh, our team at Brandon Hall Group is excited about all the the great work you're doing with your clients and how you are providing perspective and really helping organizations, um, you know, in, empower and inspire, um, you know, them during this this unprecedented time. And I'd also like to welcome Bob Rosen, the CEO of Healthy Companies. Welcome, Bob. Hi, Rachel. How are you? It, great. And I, you know, it was, uh, it was a pleasure just chatting with you earlier, kind of teeing up our discussion for today and uh, getting to learn about some of the client work that you're doing and how you and Ron are um, collaborating here. It'd be great for each of you, and maybe Ron, I'm going to start with you. Could you share a little bit of background about you and Alan Com, just uh, to give our listeners a little bit more uh, a perspective about you and your organization? Sure. Well, again, I've been fortunate to be the CEO of Alan now for close to 17 years, and, and, and a leader and a, and a executive in, in, the, in the training industry for close to the, almost 30 years. And you know, one of the things I've learned is, is that you can achieve a lot more with a positive outlook than a negative outlook in our, in our industry. And, and this is probably one of the hardest years for all of our peers in the HR profession. They've been called on to do many new things, take on new roles, uh, become internal marketers, become call centers for people transitioning to remote, to remote work. And, you know, in this kind of an atmosphere, Alan, you know, has taken on the mantle of trying to help companies accelerate change. And I think as, as a company that focuses on creating successful training for, for many companies, uh, you know, we're very fortunate to have one of our partners here, Healthy Companies, that leads in the leadership arena. For us, it's all about quality and scale. Uh, but with all that, I really want to leave everybody with a sense of optimism that we have an opportunity as training professionals to come out a lot stronger from this uh, pandemic than, than we went into it. But for that, we're going to have to make a lot of hard decisions. We're going to have to embrace the health of our leadership, which is a topic we're going to talk about today. And there are just a host of other issues we could focus on as we become stronger as, 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 a, as a training organization and better as people. Uh, in, in our industry. And from a research company, we, are, we see those companies that are at a position right now that have been able to continue their, um, their ability to support and transition their workforce through their process, through their technology, you know, they're still able to continue during this very difficult time. And um, Bob, we were just talking earlier to you about, you know, a lot of um, the things that leaders need to be um, focused on and, and how they need to be uh, the, um, the, the, the mindset they need to have. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and your background as well? And then I'd like to kind of get started in, um, in sharing a little bit about leadership and authentic leadership and, you know, what um, the well-being of, of leaders and how they can navigate during this um, constant um, challenging times of crisis. Sure, sure, be delighted. Uh, we've been in business for uh, 35 years. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a businessman, and we started out um, with a big grant from the MacArthur Foundation to study leadership and healthier companies and organizations. And what was really clear 
in our CEO research, where we've interviewed well over 600 CEOs of large corporations in about 55 countries, was that the most successful ones were self-aware and deeply committed to their development, which enabled them to understand the value and the priority of their human agenda, driving their operations marketplace agendas and the finance agenda was a scorecard. And so, and as a result, we started seeing that there was a core capability that these CEOs had, which was to be what we call grounded and conscious people. And so uh, we, we sort of in, broadened our approach from working with CEOs into developing this core capability inside large workforces around scale and impact. And that's sort of what we do today. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, and our partnership with Alcom has been great uh, in terms of using their methodology and their expertise and bringing our core content together and, uh, and touching large numbers of people. Um, uh, there's a reason for why this is so important today. And that is because uh, the world is changing faster almost uh, than our ability to adapt. And the combination of the emphasis on health and well-being and organizational resilience and change agility and remote working uh, has made the job of leaders difficult, as Ron said and also required much more emphasis on the emotional and social muscle of leaders uh, to actually connect with and lead people through all this disruption and change. All right, and, and we know that the health and well-being of leadership is critical to the business and, and to the success of the business. How do we, how do, we do that? You know, how, you know, I see in our research at Brandon Hall Group, in our recent report on wellness and well-being is that over 70% of companies actually have wellness programs in place, whether it addresses, you know, we can slice and dice and take a look at, you know, what does that look like? Because there's different types of wellness. There's actual wellness that is about health. There's wellness that is about mental health and other aspects. Um, so that in itself, you know, what, what do we provide leaders and what is the right blend of a wellness program that's effective? And then, you know, how do we get more companies to actually participate? Because our numbers also show that a very low percentage of organizations are actually aware of all their of all the resources available to them, and that are actually participating and leveraging these resources. Well, maybe I'll take a shot, and and Ron, I'll I'll turn it to you. Um, we see uh, a sort of a virtual triangle of focusing on leadership health and well-being, team health and well-being, and organizational health and well-being. And what has been missing in, uh, in the field is that wellness has been traditionally a program that people go to uh, rather than a business strategy and an organizational strategy for the health of the organization. And that's a fundamental shift that has occurred. And the best companies are recognizing that uh, they need to build healthy employees and healthy cultures at the same time. Uh, uh, one, one part of our approach is being grounded, and it's really a holistic model that focuses on our physical health, which helps us become agile, our emotional health that helps us be tough and nimble, our intellectual health, which enables us to be relevant in a complex world, our social health, which enables us to be authentic, and our vocational health, which is really about being competitive and finding meaning in your work. And lastly, a spiritual health. And it operates, and it's real, spiritual health is sort of how you see the world. Are you generous? Do you have a sense of gratitude? Um, do you have a higher purpose? And, and they all work together. And traditionally, wellness has kind of separated them and compartmentalized them but we see people showing up as whole people and we need to, we need to connect with them as whole people. Yeah. You know, Rachel, if I can add, you know, when we, when we put a performance consultant in front of a, a subject matter expert or a leader in, 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 a, in a large organization, we often come back with this, not a surprise, but this observation that a lot of what we're talking about is very disjointed. 
in an organization. They have a wellness program, as you said, they have leadership principles, they have a technology that they use to, to, to deliver training, um, and all of that exists in its own little world. And what's happened since February, March of, of 2020 is that disconnecting is, is costing companies a lot of time and it's costing them and creating a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. when, when we look at leaders today, uh, even across the large section, if we're talking about pharmaceutical companies, financial companies, you know, uh, manufacturing, we see similar, a similar malaise, a similar problem in how they are now equipped to expose themselves to their employees. You know, I, I mentioned to you guys a bit before this call, you know, I was used to meeting with all of our employees, you know, once a month, once a quarter. I am in a town hall every week since the pandemic started. We are now today in a few hours doing our 31st town hall. At the average of four to six a year, we're ready at 31. And what that means for leaders to function, they have to know how to be that authentic and that empathetic, that resilience that Bob is talking about, because they have no choice. Because what's the alternative? If they go in front of their people, if they expose themselves to more people than ever, and they're not authentic, and they have a hard time expressing what's in their heart, and they have a hard time uh, relating to social injustice, which is an issue for us this year, or to grief, or to anxiety, they're going to not just lose credibility as leaders, they're gonna impact how that company can even talk about its culture and its value to its employees. So building that type of self-awareness is not a luxury. And I think that if we embrace it, we are gonna be stronger in 2021. In fact, growing a crop of leaders that knows how to feel vulnerable mm -hmm. is an asset. It's not a weakness. That distance that leaders tend to like so they can feel that they are different and project that difference is not an asset anymore. And you know, we're now seeing each other, talking to each other online. That is scalable. You know, again, in two hours, I'm going to be in front of potentially 130 people. They're sitting in their living rooms, their kids are in the background. Their pets are running around. You know, I have to be in the office today. I could be in my bedroom having that same town hall. That vulnerability is something we need to embrace. Yep. This is why I think we need to take a much more holistic approach to understanding people. Um, and leaders frequently don't pay attention to this uh, with themselves. They're too busy. They're working long hours. They're balancing incredible amounts of trade-offs and tensions. And um, and the employees are really asking for this. They need it. They want this kind of relationship. Now, one of the things that Ron talked about, so grounded is kind of like the foundation. And it sort of uh, protects you from the winds of change. And there are a lot of them today. But Ron was talking about another skill that's very important, which is being conscious. And we define conscious as, are you aware of yourself? Are you aware of others? And are you aware of your environment or surroundings? And we used to think that uh, being smart was, was the most important skill in corporations. But I think smart has become table stakes. Being conscious is a much more important and critical capability. So when we think about conscious, we think about one, uh, are you getting real with people? Are you really talking honestly about what's working and not working? Um, are you comfortable with being uncomfortable, as Ron was talking about? Um, and, and do you know the difference between facts and assumptions? Um, then you have to go deep and experience the change. And a lot of leaders want to run over it or deny it or pretend, push it under the rug, but it exists. and people have very different reactions to change. And so we have to move from our more difficult emotions, which are natural, and we need to experience and express them, like anxiety and sadness and fear, but move to our positive emotions as quickly as possible, 
like empathy and compassion and joy and hope and, and love. And, and those positive emotions will help get us through uh, the day. Um, um, but that's just one half of it. The other half is that we have to learn to think big. When we're going through change, imagination is a really, really important capability to, to imagine a better future um, and to be a possibility thinker um, and to be constantly learning like a Google machine and a search engine um, and then to build personal ecosystems. I mean, people are being connected like never before. And those collaborators and those connectors are going to be the most successful leaders. And then ultimately, we need leaders to step up, to be change agents, um, to be able to live with just enough anxiety because it exists everywhere, to be, to be constructive and impatient with your workforce. And, and also to build this shared consciousness so people are aligned around a common vision for the enterprise. And that takes a very different kind of leader. And what I'm hearing is when you refer to uh, conscious, be conscious, it's beyond just self-awareness. Oh, yes. Self in the past for a leader was about being able to reflect and self-actualize how you respond to others and how you are perceived. But this is also being aware of your surroundings in a much bigger way and being if you if you want it because i think that is um an interesting concept of beyond just self-awareness in that kind of the evolution of of this concept of leadership of the importance of what it of the attributes of leadership yeah. yeah we see conscious as awareness in action mm -hmm. and that's a very different way of thinking about being conscious you know, Rachel, the, the, the companies that come out of this strong are not going to be just the ones that happen to be selling toilet paper or hand sanitizer. There are a lot of companies doing well, and there are a lot of companies doing okay, and there are a lot of companies suffering under this pandemic. But it is going to end. We're going to get through it. And mm -hmm. those that can focus on looking at their leadership group, looking at the people that have risen above the fray, but also realizing that you can, you can get content from companies like Bob's. You can sit with our performance consultants and our designers, and you can make that into a programmatic asset that will help uplift all of your leadership. I would say even more than that. We're discovering more as, as companies, everybody's a leader. You look at how many interactions, face-to-face video-based interactions, our customers are having with their customers, right? You look at you know online banking, right? You look at customer service that's incorporating video. It's the idea to be able to project a certain authenticity that we're talking about, that consciousness. It's not just for the leadership in the organization. It is working its way down. And the more companies invest in creating a standard of consciousness, a standard of authenticity, an ability to use anxiety as a positive thing look the science is out there a little bit of anxiety makes you it makes you better in many cases too much anxiety takes you down mm -hmm. and i think that you know knowing how to use your partners to help you knowing how to invest in your in, in your leadership is really what's going to help separate those that come out stronger from this mm -hmm. pandemic to those uh that 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 falter and flounder. So one of our roles as, as training organizations, you know, Alan's case in helping companies scale and standardize and create programs internally, you know, and, 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 and Bob and his company, which have just broken ground when it comes to the new model for leadership that, it, that is existing now in the industry, you know, there, there's a very important dynamic here that needs to play out. And yeah. when you start about optimism, what I'm hearing a lot from companies and, and from people that are managing this time and that are not, not um, you know, you're, you're going to have your moments, but they're looking at this as kind of an opportunity. I remember in the beginning, and I may have had this conversation with you, Ron, when everything was very quiet and we just kind of had our, our the um, initial shutdown when everybody was inside and you go out and you'd hear the birds chirping, you actually saw 
that the rivers were, were um, running clearer and the oceans were bluer. It was almost like a standstill where we had a moment to just kind of like pause. And now it's an opportunity as we kind of are moving forward is how do we take this quiet time and make or, or look into the future and create an even better future. And I think when people, like when I talk to Bob and to you, Ron, and to others that are looking at this time in a positive way, that's when you can really, I think, make a, like a, that's when you have the ability to change and and make change for the good. Yeah. So what do you I, think? I do. I do think, that, Rachel. I couldn't agree more. And I think that the uh, the whole COVID-19 experience and the, the whole working at home experience has given people uh, a fresh opportunity to see what's important in life. Um, mm -hmm. That our friends and our family and our health and well-being, uh, that people can work at home comfortably and some people really prefer it. And companies are recognizing that they've spent lots of money on real estate. Uh, and, and talk about an industry that is scared right now because you're going to see all companies, and you're already seeing it, who are fundamentally changing where and how people work. And, um, and I also think globally with the environment, there's so many trends that are coming together that are forcing and also inspiring people to look differently about a more positive future. Um, but when you're in it, it feels like scary, fearful, you, you know, um, but the sun is going to shine and the power of hope is very, very real. Yeah. You know, I would encourage any leader or person who wants to be a leader or person who used to be a leader that's listening to this podcast to just do a bit of an inventory. Okay. How do they project their leadership pre-March 2020? And how are they projecting their leadership now? You know, what, what tools are they using now? What tools did they use then? Uh, it's incumbent on the executives in these large companies to say, am I equipping my leaders to be successful? And the success is not what it was in 2019. The success of what it will what it's what it will be in 2021, 22, 23. And being conscious of that, being uh, assertive and not being afraid uh, to change it is going to be a critical component of what we will see as the successful companies of, of the 2020s and 2030s. You know, at Allen, we, we, we are not bystanders. We're lucky to be involved in that. Uh, you know, we're lucky to have partnerships with Bob. We're lucky to work with the largest companies in the nation. But it's still incumbent on all of us to realize that we have to think a bit outside of our comfort zone. Um, I've mentioned social justice in, in this conversation. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how much that is a term that we're going to see more and more discussed, you know, in the, in the next, next few years. And you know, equipping leadership to be conscious and to be proactive, uh, not in the way that, you know, creates fervor, but in a way that creates calmness and deliberation. Those are the aspirations, I think, that these board of directors who sit down and say, oh, we want a more resilient organization. Well, what the heck does that mean? Uh, I know Bob knows what that means. I know that I'm still struggling with it, you know, because the resilience I thought, you know, being strong and being sure of myself, I find I get more done by being vulnerable now sometimes. It is easier on a Zoom call to say, I just had a conversation with a neighbor who lost his job. And this is what it made me feel. In the past, I would never do that. So there's a great opportunity for us to become better, better human beings, which of course is always our objective, right? But also better leadership, better stewards of our companies. Uh, assets. Uh, I do. Our people. I just want to build on something that Ron said. Uh, traditionally, we have thought that what you do defines who you are, and oftentimes described by your job. Um, but there is a paradigm shift that's going on uh, that who you are drives what you do and how you perform. 
and that who you are as a healthy human being, as a healthy leader, um, is really more important than ever. And companies have done a little bit of this with emotional intelligence and uh, maybe with integrity and ethics, but we're talking about a acceleration into the who you are space around character and purpose and self-awareness. And uh, one of our clients is Cigna. And Cigna, Cigna is 75,000 people and they're a Fortune 10 company. And they have put the grounded and conscious perspective in the middle of their leadership model. And it's surrounded by the competencies, which are more behavioral and more job focused. And so if you don't start with who you are, it's really hard to get the commitment and the performance in a sustainable way with behavior change. Yeah. And, you know, Rachel, that will trickle down. I mean, our model for compliance training, for example, just give one area that's very needed in our industry is changing. You know, what do you root that compliance in? Do you root it in, hey, we just want you never to do that? Because if you do it, the company's going to suffer. Or do we root it in, there is, it is wrong to do. Here's why it's wrong. Here's why it impacts you as an individual, not just the company. That ability to use rich media, that ability to use technology like we're on today for this podcast is opening up a lot of opportunity to create learning experiences. And those learning experiences have to be the medium by which we scale consciousness. I mean, think of what Healthy Companies is trying to achieve. They're really trying to achieve how people think about themselves, right? And I, if I'm wrong, Bob, please correct me. For a way for them to do better in how they think about other people. You know, start from that, that who am I and, and what am I doing? And what am I thinking? What do I feel? How do you scale that? I mean, that's why I love coming to work every day, even if it's getting out of my bed, putting on, a, you know, work clothes and sitting literally five feet away from my bed. But it's still that idea that we come to work to help people be better. And when people are better, organizations are better. And I, I'm fully convinced, again, I will say this because I believe in it, we will come out stronger if we pick the right things to focus on. Uh, I, I, go ahead, Rachel. Um, and I think that as, as this whole conversation evolves in corporate America, we're going to see that uh, being grounded and conscious affects supply chain management. It affects financial organizations. It affects marketing and sales. Um, it affects how we come together as teams. It affects our social responsibility. Um, how do we expect to create socially responsible workforces if people don't understand the power of being part of something much bigger than yourself? or having a sense of generosity and gratitude and putting yourself in other people's shoes. I mean, we talk about diversity and inclusion and equity, but what's behind that? You need people who see themselves as equal to other people as human beings. Yeah. And they're able to confront and, 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 and be vulnerable as they question their biases and assumptions. So it all goes back to who you are and how you look at yourself and you look at the outside world. Yeah. And none of this is about weakness, right? Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that vulnerability is a weakness. <clears throat> that would be the same as telling me saying res resilience is a weakness. It's not because the resilient resilience comes out of being able to not be afraid, you know, to, to, to sometimes to be more authentic in front of people. Resilience comes out of a, of, of, a, of a yearning to serve, right? And knowing that you can do a good job if you're equipped and that you've been put in a position to lead, okay? Um, you know, and, and again, I, I think that we can easily misconstrue some of this to think that, oh, you know, are we gonna be more wishy-washy? It's the opposite, Rachel. It, it, it's really the opposite. I mean. Um, Again, I can only be, give my personal example. When I have these company meetings, I get strength from them. Mm -hmm. You know, by, by having to say about something good and maybe something bad that happened in the past week, 
hearing how people react, you know, it, it is, it is a, a filling up of the battery of my resilience to say, okay, this is going to be a week where we're going to have to deal with some employees that have family members that have COVID because every week brings up one of those. This is going to be a week where, you know, uh, one of my employees is going to have to take a mental health day because just life has caught up with them and that's okay. And this is going to be a week where a customer is going to say, well, you know, our, our you know, we, we've had to shut down two or three plants because of a COVID outbreak. So we can't do the program that we, we've paid you to do. Mm-hmm. Everything I just described happened to me this week. Every single example is real from just this week. And we're on Thursday. And I take from that, the strength I get from it is being able to talk to that employee who wants to take a mental health day and say to them, it is good. We have a program for that. And you're going to come back stronger and go to that customer who had to shut down uh, a plant, right? And, and, and say to them, you know what? We're still here for you. It's, it's not an issue. Yes, we're going to have to rearrange your team, be honest and open, but we're still here. And, and come back to that employee who has a son who's now had to uh, be quarantined for COVID. You know what? You're not the only one. You're five and six of us have gone through that. And guess what? We know that it can turn out okay. And and having those conversations gave me a lot of energy to also have the other conversations. How's our, how are we doing in our quotas? You know, how are we doing in our customer service? Those regular conversations. But I got that energy from, from that authentic, sometimes vulnerable place that I was put into as a leader. There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, Ron, and, and thank you, Bob, and, and thank you both for sharing about some of your personal experience as well as the work and, and um, the types of, of examples that you are um, supporting your clients with and, and personally what you're going through, Ron. And, you know, and just to recap here, I think we're, our takeaways here for those of you that are listening is that we are in a very challenging, yes, an unprecedented time. There is no question about it. But in order for us to be able to survive and to thrive and to come out on the other side, whether it's a few months from now, a year from now, or a couple years from now, we have to be as optimistic as we can, but also realistic, because there are things that are going to be thrown at us that we sometimes can't control, whether it's our loved one getting sick, an employee or coworker getting sick. We've had some of the experiences here at Brennan Hall Group as well. And I think the best we can do, whether you're a leader or you are on someone on the team, is the way that you can respond. Um, maybe it's a couple of words that you can share to help, um, you know, let, you know, give someone your ear. Um, but just to, to try to react in a human, as humanly and kindly as possible. And then also think about the future and how we can move forward and the things that we could do that can make positive change. Sure. Good words. Thank you yep. both. Thank you. Thank you be so. healthy, be safe. Good luck um, in your um, town meeting. Uh, and um, we'll, 31. We'll 31. <laughs> well, 31. It, it's great that you're doing that. So I'm sure your your people are looking forward to hearing what you have to say and, and helping them get through this. So that it's great that you're you're doing I'll what you do. And that's part of why we're doing these podcasts on these topics. We've done pulse surveys a lot during this time frame, just to kind of gather insights and to be able to share um, examples. And you know, whether it's re- relevant today or tomorrow, you know, we're just constantly putting out good information and examples from from leaders like the two of you today. Well, Rachel, the work that that you all do at the Brandon Hall Group is amazing i mean i have followed the company for a very long time and uh and uh and and also how you've grown i mean you can't grow without applying some of these principles um because because people don't want to step into an uncertain future they want to lean into the power of growth and uh so thank you for that and uh, i do think it's a really unique time in history uh, it's a really people are really hungry for this, and uh, and I think we all need to just step up and help them do it. 
you know, every day, you know, I'm grateful. Our team is grateful to be here and to to have um, great partnerships and clients. And to and one of the things I personally love about the work that we do and the industry that we are in, um, in spite of good times, bad times, we're always trying to help people. We're always trying to create a solution, create a um, you know help with providing insights and point of views and sharing information that can really shape and transform companies, right. transform teams, products, ideas, innovate constantly. So in everything that we do, you know, I've, I've been in this industry during the recession and okay. in spite of all the challenging times, we are still able to persevere and to keep moving forward. And I think it's the mindset. I think it's being able to reflect on what is happening and to try to think differently apply what is happening and just just continue to forge forward with resilience and yeah fortunately fortunately we're hardwired genetically and psychologically for growth and opportunity mm -hmm. um but our surroundings are more uncertain and it's challenging people to ratchet up their development as we go through it sure very true well stay strong stay healthy thank you Bob and you Ron, bet. and thank you for listening in. Thank you, Rachel.